We're building up godly men for a better tomorrow. This is On the Edge with Ken Harrison, where we inspire men of integrity to put faith into action together. Just before we get into today's episode, we'd like to invite you to subscribe to our weekly devotional group. Just text the two words, Promise Keepers, to 31996. Every week you'll receive a challenging devotional that will inspire you to put your faith into action in the real world. Again, text Promise Keepers to 31996. And now, here's today's show. Uh, today we talk to one of the great American heroes of all time, one of my really close friends. I've counted an honor uh, to talk to General Jerry Boykin, uh, founding member of Delta Force, of uh, the man who chased down and caught Pablo Escobar, the man who took Manuel Noriega into custody, the man who was a commanding officer of Black Hawk Down uh, in Mogadishu, with the, which they made a movie about, the man who survived being shot with a 50 caliber machine gun bullet through a helicopter in a battle in Grenada. Jerry Boyke isn't just a great American hero. He's a, one of the great Christian leaders and great humble men of our time. So Jerry Boykin, we've been uh, friends for 10 years, has it been? Yeah, it seems like it. And I remember the first night we met each other because we were invited to come out and hang out in the Colorado mountains, smoke cigars buy a fireplace and tell stories yeah. and i told a story and you told a story and then i thought i think i'll shut up and let jerry tell the story for the rest of the night because mine don't compare yeah, come on hey we're we're old warriors you know you're you're a police warrior i'm a i'm an army warrior you know we tell stories that's what we do so that's and right it's, that's and right. it's always one upmanship you know you know, that's that was the problem. I, I realized I couldn't one up you. I mean, uh, we're going to get into some of those stories here. Uh, it's funny. I was just with a Delta Force guy, which you were you were a Ranger, Green Beret, and Delta, right? right. Yeah. And I said to him, uh, I said, Jeff, uh, you know, from what I understand, Delta, the British Royal Marines, the, the Russian Special Forces, the Israelis, those are the those are the baddest fighting dudes on the planet. And he said. Well, you'd be right, except for when you included the Russians, the British, and the Israelis, you insulted Delta Force. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, and I think that is the consensus. I mean, as I talk to guys, you were a founding member of Delta. Uh, yeah. You guys really are the baddest dudes on the planet. And I was shocked to find there's not that many of you. I mean, it was like 250 or something active Delta guys. That's it. Yeah, there's never a whole lot. Uh, see, the, the attrition rate uh, to just get through the uh, assessment and selection course is very high. Uh, and in fact, uh, the acceptance rate is only about 18%. And uh, it may fluctuate, it may go to 20, it may drop down to 15. But it, that, that's a ballpark figure. That's what it was when I was still commanding there. And I don't think it's changed much today. So you don't get a lot of the people that want to be there. You don't, they, they don't make it through the course. But the ones who do, uh, generally speaking, have overcome a lot of personal uh, mm. anxieties about things, and uh, they're they're for the most part they're committed to to being there and serving there. Now, do you have to be in special forces or special ops to get into Delta in the first place, or how does that? How do you get in? Yeah, you can be a cook in the mess hall. Really, if you can make it through the assessment and selection. Uh, and, and the psychological uh, test, then you can get in there. We, in fact, one of the most bizarre guys that we we had in there, who actually happened to be a a good operator, was a guy that was a, a heavy equipment operator. Now nobody would have thought that a heavy equipment hmm. operator would make it through this course, which is thirty days of, of very rigorous uh, activities up in the mountains. And uh, this guy made it through and uh, made it through the psychological aspects of it as well. And he turned out to be a good operator. He had he was on a steep learning curve, uh, unlike the guys that were in uh, special forces and rangers and that type of thing or even infantry. Right. Right. But he uh, he he was a quick learner and he turned out to be a good operator. Hmm. OK, so I don't, I want to make sure we get to your stories because they're amazing. And uh 
tell us about the story about when you were going through Delta and they were really trying to flunk you out because of your Christian faith and, uh, you know, how the Lord met you that, that one night in the mountains is pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, I went through the assessment section in 1978 and, uh, at the, out in the mountains there, the very last day in the mountains there, you go 40 miles and I, and I went that 40 miles with a very heavy load. And I did it in 11 hours and 27 minutes. And uh, they brought us back to Fort Bragg and they brought in a psychologist. Well, we started with 118 people and we only had 19 people left. I mean, that was all that was left of the 118 that started. So, um, but I, I was very open about my faith. I, I was very clear that, you know, I was a Christian. I was a practicing Christian and, and that was a priority in my life. And uh, the psychologist took me into his office and said, you know, uh, I'm going to recommend against you being part of this new Delta course. And I said, uh, why? And he said, well, you just won't fit in here because you're too religious. You do, you, you, require, you rely too much on your faith. And as I say to people, I, you know, I'm thinking, and you rely on your nose to breathe and I'm going to break <laughs> it for you. You know, <laughs> that was a little bit in the flesh and I'm, I'm hopefully I'm beyond that now, but I, I couldn't believe this guy. I'd finished that uh, that long walk to 40 miles in 11 hours and 27 minutes. First one through, and now this guy sitting there telling Which me. Which was a record for like 20 years, wasn't it? That, well, what you it, was said. A, it was tied with another guy. It was wow. tied with a guy that wound up being my, my command sergeant major, uh, Mel Wick. And uh, so um, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. And, and, uh, and I, uh, that, that weekend before they were going to make the decision, I actually went home and talked to my mother who is the prayer warrior of the family. God rest her soul and a wonderful Christian woman. And I said, I don't know if they're going to take me or not, but more importantly, I don't know if I want to be there. So I need to know, I need to know before they make their decision on Monday morning, I need to know whether they, whether they want me or not. But more importantly, I need to know whether that's where God wants me. So I said, you know, I, I've got to, I've got to really pray about that. That Sunday morning before I went back to, uh, back to Fort Bragg, I left, uh, I, I went to church with my mom. And at that time, my dad did not go to church. He eventually came to Christ and did. But uh, at that time, uh, my mom and I went to, went to church and you know, the Bible says you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And as I was praying that morning, I heard the voice of the Lord very clearly tell me that I was to be there. I knew that that's where I was supposed to be. I went back and uh, sat uh, before a board of officers and non-commissioned officers with the cantankerous old Colonel that founded the Delta Force a guy named Charlie Beckwith, an old Georgia football player. And uh, he was a legend because he had mm-hmm. been shot in the belly in uh, Vietnam with a 50 caliber and survived it. And uh, they were trying, they were bombarding me with questions and it was an intimidation attempt, you know, but I sat there and gave them responses as the uh, spirit gave me utterance uh, to questions that had no right and wrong answers. But, uh, at, at some point, old Charlie Beckwith just told everybody to stop. And he, he looked at me and he said, you're a religious fellow, aren't you? And, uh, and I, you know, Ken, you and I know very well, I'm not religious. Uh, I had a lot of religion when I was growing up. And then I'm about a relationship with Christ. And, uh, yeah, I understood what Amen. he was asking me, though. But I, you're too I, mean to be religious, Jerry. Well, yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> well, that may be true, but I am i am not a religious person. I, I, you know, normally that means you're in a works-based kind of theology, you know, if you're religious. and Look, I, I understand that there are things I can do and I can't do, but, uh, and I shouldn't do. Uh, but I, my, my, Faith is all about my relationship with Christ. And I feel like as if I'm seeking him every day, I'm looking to grow closer to him every day. He's going to show me what I can do and what I can't do. He's going to show me what's right and wrong. And when I fail and step over that line and do something that I know God has shown me is wrong, I'm going to do just what 1 John 1, 9 says. I'm going to confess my sin. 
And uh, it says he's faithful and just to forgive me, forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And that, 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 that word goes out to every man, woman, child and in the world. God is the same for everybody. He's the same in, for man as he is for a woman. And uh, at any rate, that's the story of uh, them not wanting me in the Delta Force to begin with. But uh, ultimately, they accepted me. And in fact, ultimately, my faith became kind of important to uh, the whole organization. Yeah, we were supposed to be together t- this evening demonstrating how not religious we are by smoking some cigars, and you got double booked. So you're in Louisiana, yeah, and I'm here world. in Washington, D.C. Yeah. But uh, next time, um, yeah. besides, we, it's always better to get together in the Colorado Mountains anywhere. That's where <laughs> you and I both belong. Um, my my daughter thinks I'm pretty cool uh, because Ashton was really into the show Narcos, which uh, she says, Dad, you know, you got to watch. And I, well, what's it about? Well, it's about them catching Pablo Escobar. I said, well, my friend Jerry is the one who caught Pablo Escobar. What? <laughs> you got to tell that story. I guess whatever version of that you're legally allowed to tell. <laughs> well, Pablo Escobar, for those who don't know, was the uh, drug lord in Colombia who really, uh, I think, was almost in a position that he was the primary leader uh, government leader, as a matter of fact, in that country. But uh, Pablo had was making billions. He was probably the wealthiest man in the world because of probably the money. So. That was, yeah. And uh, Pablo um, was on, you know, certainly on the most wanted list uh, for the United States. Well, he cut a deal. Pablo cut a deal with the uh, government of Colombia that he would uh, plead guilty and then he would go to jail for a period of time. And it would be in his town, his, his town of Medellin. And, uh, and he would build the prison and he would provide the guards and the government, it, it, it was the best the government fe- felt like they could get. So they gave in and they let that deal go through. So here you got, you got, uh, you got Pablo Escobar in a prison guarded by guards that, uh, he built the prison and he controlled the guards. He paid the guards and all that. So it was a sham. So he could leave there anytime he wanted to. And then finally, President Gaviria came in. President Gaviria said, this is enough of this nonsense. We're going to uh, we're going to capture him and uh, put him in a real prison. And they got word of it. Uh, his guards got word of it. So when when uh, President Gaviria sent his uh, his people up there, they uh, they got in a little firefight with uh uh, Pablo Escobar's people, and uh, and they eventually uh, they all took off and uh, left the prison. And when uh, Gaviria's troops got in there, they discovered that Pablo was gone. Pablo was not in that prison. Now they could see where he was living. They could see, you know, the, the evidence of him being there. But he took off, and uh, he had ways in and out of there. Uh, just for a situation like this. So we were told in the Delta Force to go down there and capture Pablo Escobar. So we went down. Uh, we immediately set up operations, and uh, we started searching for Pablo Escobar with the help of the intelligence community. Uh, we we searched for him for a long time. We found him a couple of times, and then he, he would get away, and he would get away because the Colombians were working with him. So as soon as we would get a hit on him, the Colombians had a way of notifying him, and he would all of a sudden he'd disappear again. So we realized it was going to be a long haul. So we, we got down there in July of uh, 92, and we set up for the long haul. And, and when we finally found him and got, to, got an opportunity to go after him, uh, it was uh, November of 93. But we stayed, we stayed with it, and we, I mean, we pursued him for that amount of time. We really pursued him, and uh, the way we finally caught him was we found him. And unlike what the uh, what the news tell, says about Delta killing him, we actually did not kill him. We found him. We found him at his mother's home. We found him on a cell phone, or not a cell phone, but on one of those uh, cordless phones. Remember when those were popular? We mm-hmm. found him on a cordless phone 
We drove by, looked through the window, and there he was. And we got to Columbia's, rallied them, and we said, okay, he's in there. So drive back up to the house, jump out, blow the door, and uh, you got him. Well, they did, and they uh, they busted into the house. And, of course, he was standing at the bottom of the stairs barefooted, and he shot uh, two or three shots, and but didn't hit anybody. He ran up on the roof, started off across the roof, and the Colombians chased him out onto the roof and shot him. Now, when they shot him, he had one one shot in his right buttocks, one shot in his right temple, another shot in his left temple, <laughs> and, and powder burns, powder burns on him. <laughs> so in their report, and we've got pictures of it, in their report, they wrote that he got caught in a crossfire. Now, I think it's obvious that he went down once they hit him in the hip, and then they walked up to him and they gave him, what do you call it, the coup de grace in both temples. But nonetheless, the report stood, and that that's the way it is. That's their story, and they're sticking to it. And that's yours, and you're sticking to it. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> repeating what they said. Uh-huh. Um, so I was with... Uh, Colonel Oliver North yesterday, whom you've been friends with for a long, long time. And oh. I asked him about the story you told about how you guys met. Can, yeah. I don't know. Can you tell that story? On I can on tell this? that story. Yeah. Yeah. We were. It was 1983 and I was sent to uh, Sudan with one radio operator, a sergeant. And the, the uh, in, in South Sudan, what is South Sudan today, the nation of South Sudan, up on the uh, border of Kenya and Ethiopia, there's a uh, place called Boma Hills or Boma Mountain. And it's a 3,000-foot plateau that just comes right up out of the savannas out there. And uh, up on top of that mountain, there's a missionary station up there. And those missionaries have been up there for decades ministering to uh, a pro really what is a loincloth tribal society up there. I mean, these are people that uh, have worshipped pagans for, you know, centuries. But the top of that mountain is their home, and, and, and they, they love it up there, but they really are very primitive. But these missionaries up there had been ministering to them, bringing the word of God to them, and I, and I was sent over there to help them rescue helped the Sudanese rescue them. And I had worked with Sudanese Special Operations, which is their airborne force. They had a little airborne company. I'd worked with them before. So uh, I linked up with them. We went down to Juba, which today is the capital of South Sudan. And we we worked a, a plan with them. We gave them intelligence. We gave them uh, weather. Uh, we gave them everything that uh, we could give them and to include a rehearsal and uh, we gave them, uh, you know, we gave them photos of the top of that mountain and the missionary station and the, and the little places where people could be uh, concealed. And then we got ready to go. And they said to me, and I, they said to me, well, you're going, aren't you? Well, what do you say? I mean, I, I had no authority to go with them. I had no authority to go to the top of that mountain with them. I was just there to train them and get them ready and give them what they needed. But there's only one right answer. You know, oh, yeah, I'm going with you. So I jumped on the aircraft and went went up on top of that mountain with them. And they and the, when they hit the ground up there, the first guy that jumped out of the helicopter, one of the helicopters, he got killed. And it, it, I mean, you know what your first instinct is: this is not going to be good. But that from that point on, the Sudanese controlled the top of that mountain, and they rescued all five of those missionaries. They killed, I think, I. I I understood 17 at the time. Now there's a report. It's, it was 19 of the rebels that were up there. But we, we recovered these missionaries and we put them on, on aircraft and we flew them back into Juba. Well, about the time I got back into Juba, I get this call on the satellite radio that says, get out of there quickly because the media is on its way and we don't want them to see any Americans down there. Because we told them there was no American involvement. So we get the heck out of Juba as quickly as we can before the media gets there. And there's a, there's another story in, embedded in that that I'll tell you at some time, but 
there we get down to the airfield we get on the airplane we leave and uh and we get back to the united states and the ambassador up at the state department for combating terrorism wants a briefing on what happened so i <clears throat> i take a, a marine with me that's uh uh, on the staff of the Joint Special Operations Command, and I go up to give this ambassador a briefing, and we lay out the photos and the map, and we show him where everything was, and we show him how we came in and landed, and and uh, where people were found, where the hostages were found, and where we shot some people. And we get through, and I'm not saying anything at all about me being there with him. So, because, you know, I'm not supposed to be there. Well, the CIA guy that was with us, he didn't go up on a target, but when he was down at our training area in, in uh, Juba, he thinks he's doing me a favor. And he says, Mr. Ambassador, I'm going to tell you why this was a success for me. And it is because this man was willing to get on that helicopter and go up there with them. That's what made it a successful operation. And, and this ambassador turned white and screwed himself into the ceiling. And I was a major. <laughs> and he said, Major, you have no idea how far you've exceeded your authority. You had no authority whatsoever to be up there with them. No one told you you could go. You made a terrible mistake, Major, and there's going to be consequences to this. We told the press that there were no American boots on the ground up there, and we don't lie to the press. And I mean, he was just, he was turning white and smoke coming out of his ears. And the guy next to him hadn't said a word. I don't even know who this guy is. He hadn't said a word. And then he just looked straight ahead. When the ambassador stops ranting, the guy says, well, we at the White House, get this, we at the White House are very happy with the outcome of this. And we really don't see any problems with the way it was executed. That was the end of it. The ambassador did not say another word. I could tell that guy was, that guy had some power. I didn't know what, who he was. We were walking out in the Marine that I'd brought down with me from the staff. I said, who is, who is that guy just saved my butt? And he said, uh, he's uh, some Marine major up at the National Security Council named Oliver North. And I said, well, I sure want to meet Oliver North one day and thank him. Well, we have been best of friends ever since. And uh, I'm on his board. We hunt together. And uh, he's a wonderful brother in Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. I asked about that story yesterday, sort of off camera. We were hanging out. And uh, I don't know if you know this part. You'll have to ask him next time you guys are together. But he said that after that meeting, the ambassador looked at him and said, you're going to pay for that because he'd made him look stupid in front of you guys. Did you know that? I did not know that. And, and God bless him. That's the way he, that's the kind of guy he is. He wouldn't share that with me. Yeah. It's funny. He didn't share that with you. The other thing he said was that they had a picture of you that had um, gone in. They had made sure that there were no photos of any Americans anywhere. They had a photo of you that had printed in that newspaper, the local newspaper. It showed the guys, but, but from behind, it showed a part of you. So North had gone to president Reagan and written a letter for him, making sure that everybody was clear so that when it was all over too, he had a letter from the president saying that what you did was okay by him. Pretty, pretty he, amazing. He is far too, uh, professional to share those kinds of things with me. Well, I just did. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm glad. I, I'm glad to know that. And thank you for, for sharing that. But, uh, yeah, he, he's a wonderful friend and I, uh, uh, we have been friends ever since then. Yeah, he's a good man of Christ. And I mean, and you too. I mean, there, I was with you. We were up fishing together when you got fired um, for saying something horrible <laughs> that you wouldn't allow a man to follow your daughter into a bathroom. And yeah. you were teaching at, uh, I always forget the name of that college you were teaching at. What's that? Hamden Sydney College. Yeah, Hamden Sydney. And you got fired. Um, and then the students, uh, un, you know, the opposite of what we always read about, the students march on the campus to support you. And how dare they fire you? And I was with you when, when uh, 
I don't remember if we were there in the river together or if it had just occurred that day, but you had gotten the call from the president kind of having to eat crow and rehire you. Uh, and you were so gracious. And I remember thinking, man, I would have had to spike the ball in his face a little bit because he was, he didn't want you at that college after not standing up for transgenderism. Um, yeah. But you were, were an example of Christ. And that was when I really realized, man, after all you've done to show that kind of humility was pretty special. Yeah, and that has taken some work to. Uh, it's, it's not my first instinct, but I think God has shown me a lot of grace, you know. And uh, I mean, there's a time to fight, and then there's a time to uh, make some of these people feel terrible just by treating them very kindly and very gently. And sometimes that is far more effective. Then coming right back at them, getting in their face, and you just have to discern when when it's appropriate. And uh, you know that this is a the whole this whole transgender thing. First of all, it's destroying so much of what we consider to be masculinity. It's absolutely destroying it. But uh, I also think that uh, there are times when we're being uh, criticized, that we're being attacked, that uh, the enemy has loosed the demons of hell against us, that we just have to rely on the Lord. Uh, in, in spite of our instincts to want to fight, we just have to rely on the Lord. And I just I just had another situation where somebody sent me the, just last night a text because they, they, they wanted me to advocate for calling out our military or having a military coup here because they believe the election was stolen and they think the only way to restore this nation uh, constitutional republic is to call out the military. I am so adamantly against that. I am 100% adamantly against calling out our military because it makes us a third world country. And, and, and one of the principles of America is civilian control of the military. And uh, so I just, uh, this person sent me another, this is the second time they've sent me an email, wanting me to advocate for calling out the military and, uh, and, and basically performing a coup here and taking this, what they consider to be an illegitimate government. And I, 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 you know, I'm not going to respond to that with trying to explain the rationale and, and reason with them. I'm just going to say, as I did this this morning, yeah, you have your opinion and I have mine. I have served my country for 36 years. I love this country. and uh, But I'm not going to advocate something I don't believe in. And that's it, period. I'm not going to call you a knucklehead or anything like that. Well, you've called me worse than being a knucklehead, but that's just Christian brothers well, with each that, other. Yeah, but see, that's different. <laughs> you see, I love you. We're buds. And, you know, we we can call each other that, see? Because, you know, true. I'm saying it in love. That is true, too. That is true. It's funny, yeah. you know, because even, even in the 10 years that we've known each other, you know, we were having dinner a year or two ago, and I was just saying, I feel like the two of us are so much more humble than we were when we first got to know each other. And uh, <laughs> it's amazing what age and, and growing closer to Christ and experience does. And you said something really important. You said a lot of things really important. Um, there's a time to fight and there's yeah. a time to, to uh, make peace in other ways. But we have to remember that Christ said, blessed are the peacemakers, not blessed are the peacekeepers. Right. And sometimes making peace means making war, right? I mean, the, the clear-cut example in modern times is World War II, right? It, um, the, the, the godly thing to do was actually go to war, and people were going to die because we needed to save the world from the from the tyranny of Hitler, um, notwithstanding the tyranny of Stalin that was going on while we were his friend. But um, Christians need to start to understand what that is. And we're being fed a lie of pacifism, a lie of continuing to go along with the flow because we we think blessed are the are the peace um keepers but that's not what christ said blessed are the peace 
makers. We got to go out and make peace. And sometimes it means punching somebody in the mouth because there are evil yeah. people in the world. And uh, we have to understand that most of the people are enslaved to sin and we, they need the grace of Christ. But some people are enslavers. They're wicked. They're evil. You saw them in one regard uh, in all your military exploits. And I saw them in another regard on the streets of Los mm-hmm. Angeles. There are people who are just plain stone cold evil. Yeah. And scripture tells us that those people, there are some people that are so bad that God has actually turned his back on them. They can't be saved. He won't let them be saved. He's closed their eyes so they won't see the truth. And well, we have to one. have the wisdom to know that's which one is one. the other. Yeah, That's one of the places, right? Yeah, Romans that's, one. that's being given over to a reprobate mind. All right. So, Jerry, so since you brought up Romans 1, you, you know, one of the things I hear all the time from Christians who I think want to throw in the towel is, well, if you look at Romans 1, where, where Paul is talking about what happens when a soul is so turned against God and then he starts to go into homosexuality is one of those things that comes about and sexual perversion. And then God has turned his back on those people. And they say, well, America's already there. So what's the good? Let's just uh, forget about it all. And we'll just sit back and wait for Jesus to take us up to heaven. And to me, that's just coward talk dressed up in, in some kind of bad theology. Psalms 94, I think is verse six. It says, who will take a stand against this evil for me? Who will rise up against these doers of iniquity? So when we reach the state that you just described, we're, I I think that we are not doing what God's called us to do. He's called us, the believers, to rise up against evil. And it doesn't give a, a time frame. It's a general thing. We need to do it all the time, all the time. Not when we think we hear the trumpet sounding. We need to do it all the time until the Lord takes us out of here, either by a natural death or, 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 or by a rapture. We need to be standing up to evil, and there's plenty of evil in this land. And I was just praying last night about this, that the evil that is coming into this land today, the pervasiveness of the evil that we're bringing into this land. And when you think it can't get any worse, it does. And, you know, do you look at what's happening on our border right now? Mm -hmm. What kind of evil are we bringing across that border? It's, you know, the focus is on these little children that are being dropped over the over the fence. But the reality is, what kind of evil are we bringing across that border? How about fentanyl? Mm -hmm. Doesn't take much to kill half the population of America. We're bringing evil across that border. And. You got people that don't want to take a stand against it. And I believe that biblically we have to, we are supposed to take a stand against evil in whatever form it is. And right now we're seeing uh, uh, our administration, our leadership in this country that does not want to stand up to evil. In fact, they're perpetrating incoming evil into this country from different sources and, uh, and, and these people that, that don't want to stand up to it, these people that want to go sit in the corner and suck their thumb and go to church on Sunday morning and, and put their money in the, in, in the tithes and, and sing in the choir, that all that's good. All that's good. You ought to do that. But if, that, if it ends right there, you're not doing what God's called you to do. Right now, we need an army. We need a real army. We need an army that's willing to come together and stand up and fight evil because there is so much evil coming into the nation right now. And and just like the governor of Arkansas, who had a bill there before him that was designed to stop evil, and it was saying that no young man or woman could have transgender surgery, removing their genitals and replacing them with, with something that's artificial until they are 18 years old, that's the earliest that they can make the decision to do that. And that governor would not sign that bill. That governor would not sign that bill. Now, now, I believe that for anybody, I believe that it's wrong, but I believe certainly uh, up until they're 18 years old and have a much better opportunity to make a, a life-changing decision like that. 
that we should stop them. We should not allow that to happen. And uh, and here you got a governor who's supposed to be a conservative, and he wouldn't vote. He wouldn't sign it. Well, guess what? The people of Arkansas said, okay, Bubba, all we need is a majority vote in the legislature, and it's going to pass, and that's exactly what they did. Mm-hmm. And I'm really disappointed in him. But we got a lot of people like him in the in the Christian world today, in the church today, that are when it really comes down to the hard part, they're not gonna stand up to evil. And he didn't he didn't stand up to evil. Today's episode is brought to you through the generosity of Waterstone. For nearly 40 years, Waterstone has assisted givers in supporting their favorite charities, like Promise Keepers, by crafting customized, innovative giving solutions. Waterstone gift strategists stand ready to create your personalized charitable plan, utilizing business interests, real estate, appreciated assets, charitable trusts, giving funds, and more. These donor-specific giving strategies allow givers to bypass capital gains taxes, receive a fair market value charitable deduction, and have tax-free growth for years to come. Prioritize income, minimize taxes, and optimize your giving with Waterstone. Find out how to give and receive the most from your assets by visiting www.waterstone.org. As men, we're called to lead wherever God has placed us. Whether in your family, your work, your school, you have the God-given potential to transform lives and reach the world for Christ. That's why we'd like to encourage you to take the next step. Invest in your own personal growth this Father's Day weekend by registering for the Promise Keepers Men's Leadership Summit. This free one-hour leadership event features internationally renowned leadership expert John C. Maxwell, along with ministry-focused entrepreneurs David and Jason Benham and Pastor Nick Garza. It also includes a Q&A lightning round with special guests Chad Veach, Dat Wynn, Rocky Blyer, and David J. Harris. And the Leadership Summit is just the beginning. You'll also have the chance to participate in a 10-day Leadership Challenge on the Promise Keepers app that will help you build healthy habits of godly leadership. Your family, church, community, workplace all need you to become the leader you were born to be so join us on june 19th for this transformative event visit promisekeepers.org slash lead and reserve your spot today you know it says in revelations 21 8 it gives a list of the people who are going to be thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever that list starts with cowards. That's right. And it ends with all liars, which liars are just cowards. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of people running around in the name of meekness when it's really just cowardice. No, they, 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 they normally cover it in love. Love, love yes. And tolerance. When it's exactly acceptance. the opposite of love. Yeah, it's and you, exactly I mean, right. And by the way, we're talking to Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, that's a three-star general if you're keeping a count at home. And uh, you were supposed to be a four-star general. And you would have been a four-star general, but you couldn't stop standing up for Christ. And uh, yeah. so you're a man who has sacrificed a lot. You've been fired as a professor at a college. You would have been one of the, the few four-star generals in the history of this country. And you almost didn't make Delta Force because you stood for your faith. So you're a man who knows what you're talking about when it comes to courage. All that is part of a resume that will be looked at when I stand before Jesus Christ. Amen. So that means nothing here on earth. But I'm building up a resume that I want to be able to stand before him and say, because I got a lot of things that aren't going to be good that I, I got to account for, too. That, But I'm saved. <laughs> I'm redeemed. I'm washed in the blood. So I know I'm going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. But, uh, Second Corinthians 5.10, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged for the deeds done in the body, whether good or worthless. And um, let's talk about that for a minute, because you and I are both passionate about that. In fact, I'm writing a book on that right now on rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, because I think one of the reasons that men are checking out of the church is because we've gone so far into the cheap grace thing that... Um, the, the, the message that's pervade, whether, whether people mean to pervade it or not, is you said the magic prayer 
And if you say the magic prayer, then Jesus comes in your heart and you can't lose your salvation. And so you got yours and you're just going to be in heaven someday with the apostle Paul and everybody else. And there's in, there's in that an inherent sense of a lack of justice. And we think, well, so you're telling me that the apostle Paul, who was shipwrecked and freezing and starving and beaten uh, and all those things, he's just going to be in the same place that my neighbor who never did anything for anybody because he said the magic prayer. Is that right? And actually, it's not right. Um, there will be levels in heaven, rewards in heaven, and there's going to be a judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's what you're referring to when you talk about the fact that the great courage and sacrifice that you've made in your life, you know that you will be rewarded for that. Your sins are forgiven. The sins of everybody who's received Christ are forgiven, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But Ephesians 2, 10 says, where God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that were prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So you... Me, we've all had a plan that God laid down long before we were born for good works that we would do if we died to self and live for him. And we will be judged based on how we perform those works after we were saved. We didn't get to heaven by our works, but where we are in heaven will have a lot to do with what we did with our salvation. I asked you to comment on it, and then I went off and started preaching. Sorry, man. No, I no, that's good. That, and that's a message, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Ken, that you, you can't preach too much. People need to understand this. What One of the things that really bothers me, uh, and this will surprise some people, is this attitude that God's in control. I know God's in control. God's in control of the universe. But I also know that generally speaking, what, what you're saying is, therefore, I don't have to do anything. And those are the very people that will sit on the sidelines, that will, will see evil prevail, but they'll do nothing. Because God's in control. God's letting that happen. God's in control. We got to get beyond that. We've got to get beyond that and we got to put our faith into action. We've got to get beyond that and get off our backsides and make a difference in what's happening today. Because, first of all, I have grandchildren. And and will, God willing, you're going to have grandchildren. And, and it is up to us to secure their future by doing all we can to drive out evil. So this, this whole idea that, uh, that I can just sit back and do nothing and wait for that trumpet to sound and the rapture is going to take me out of here. Well, first of all, you better hope your theology is right. You better hope it's a pre-tribulation rapture. <laughs> all right. You know, because it, if, if it isn't, you're going to go through a part of this, uh, that, that the Bible tells us is coming. So, I'm with you on that. I, it, I'm tired of these nominal Christians that know their sins are washed away. They know they've been saved. They know they're going to heaven. Yeah, but do you think while you're here that God saved you just so you could go to heaven? He didn't. He saved you so you could be a warrior in his kingdom. Yes, you're going to heaven. Yes. And it's not it's not about how many good works you do. It is that you've confessed your sins. You're going to heaven. But he certainly expects you to get out there and be a warrior in his kingdom. And that's where we're coming up short. We don't have enough warriors. And, and frankly, in a lot of cases in certain churches, the women are the warriors. And the men are just absent. Yeah, so Jerry, you know, I was thinking about whether I should tell this story or not. But I, it's, not a, it, it's a simple story, but I think it's telling. Because I think when I tell this, a lot of people listening to this are going to be offended by it. And I want them to ask, well, why, why are you offended by it? So I remember a few years ago, I was with, well, actually more than a few years ago because my boys were small. But we were in Costco in the parking lot. Some people walked up asking for money. And, you know, you, you sort of go into the, do they really need money? And these two really did need money. It was a young couple in their probably late teens trying to get home. It was cold. It was, it was right before Thanksgiving. It was snowy. And I uh, gave them 20 bucks and drove off. And then I thought, why did I do that? And I said to my sons, you know, I gave him $20. I should have been more proactive than that. I should have told him about Christ. I should have gotten him a hotel room. I should have done a lot of things, boys. And this is what happens when we're not really engaged. And so I turned my truck around, went back to find him, and I couldn't find him anywhere. But while I'm doing that, I'm kind of going around the parking lot. I'm idling, so I've got my foot off the gas, and so the car's going at like three miles an hour, you know, whatever. And I'm sort of looking around to find him, and then, you know, I looked away for like two seconds and all of a sudden I hear, Hey, this yelling stop on the brakes. And 
there's a guy standing in front of my truck. So clearly he saw the truck going and just walked right in front of it and then yells. And then he starts to go off. You mother blankety blank blank. I had to kick your blankety blank. Well, this guy is like a big, heavy set, mid fifties guy um, who clearly can't see into the truck to see who he's yelling at. And I, I remember as he was F bombing me and stuff, I said, boys, you see that guy out there? He's a bully. And he's been doing this a lot because he's not even engaged in who is. So I'm going to go teach him a lesson and, um, you know, I'll be back. Put it, the truck and park and jump out of the truck. Well, he didn't realize how big I was. Um, and then once he saw how big I was, he starts to back up. And I was in really good shape and uh, obviously very well trained. And now all that confidence kind of came out. And so he starts to back away. And I said, right, wait, I thought you were going to teach me a lesson here. Oh, come on. So I'm teaching me a lesson. And he starts to run across the parking lot and I sort of walk by him and he jumps in his car and locks the door. Never did I say a, a coarse word or curse word or angry word. I just stood there and looked at him and said, well, what, where are you going? So then I go back and get in the car and I said to my sons, you see, boys, that guy has done that to how many people? Because he did that so casually and confidently. He was looking for a fight. He's humiliated man after man after man in front of his wife and in front of his kids and somebody needed to teach him a lesson and i said had he not backed up i would have knocked him out that to me is what christian men need to have an, an attitude there's the time to turn your cheek jesus christ says it's very important that people hear this he says if somebody strikes you on the right cheek turn to him your other cheek also well why did jesus say the right cheek he didn't say the cheek we always say the cheek but that's not what he says he the right cheek why? Well, if I'm going to punch, you kind of see this in the visual, if I'm going to punch somebody, I'm going to hit them on the left cheek, right? That's how a right-handed person would, would hit you on the left cheek. But if I'm going to backhand somebody, I'm going to hit them on the right cheek. This is a humiliation. This is a taking of your pride. So Jesus is not saying if someone punches you, you just have to be a punching bag. What he's saying is if someone humiliates you, someone backhands you, that's what you do to a woman or a child back in ancient his, you know, society. So we take that wrong. We have to know and understand Scripture and where Christ is coming at, because this is the God who who ran and overturned all the money changers. And we we sort of say that, we throw that out there, but try to walk into a Saturday market and run around and start throwing over tables and see how far you get. And I don't care how big you are. And yet Jesus was able to do that, and he made a bullwhip before he did it. Jesus was the one who told the disciples, you, the Pharisees, you disciples of hell. Jesus is the one who said... I came to set the world on fire and how I wish it was already a light. I came to turn father against son, mother against daughter, meaning I came to, to bring justice and truth and grace and to cause people to, to make a choice. And some people will hate that choice. And so we as, we've got to be very wise and always go with graciousness and humility and never act out of pride. But we st we've got as men to start to fight against injustice and untruth and fight for the oppressed. People like you, Jerry, know that better than anybody because you've lived it really. And you're being very humble. And I know the, the real depths of these stories you're telling. And I, I'm not going to betray what you're, you've put in confidence to me. But let's just say that you didn't play patty cake with these people that you're talking about um, there in Delta Force. I want to I want to wrap up with a story um, of you. Um, there's a million stories you could tell. And, it, it, and anybody who's listening to this, if you get a chance to hear General Boykin speak, go. Because you will, I mean, I know Jerry for a long time, very well. And yet I've heard you speak many times and I'm still always enthralled. Like, oh, I can't believe this guy's my friend. I mean, you are one of the great American heroes. You know, there's George Washington and there's Jack Pershing and there's George Patton and there's Jerry Boykin, in my opinion. But um, tell the story about how God miraculously saved you. I think you're the only person ever to have been hit with this kind of injury and survived it as far as I know it. And if anybody out there has ever fired a 50 cal ma machine gun, the force and the power of that weapon, it's scary just to fire one, let alone to think about being on the other side of that bullet. So, so tell us that story and how God miraculously saved you. Yeah. Well, I'm not the only person that's ever survived one. Uh, it, there are not a lot of us, but, uh, my, the commander of the Delta force, when I was a young man there actually survived a 50 cal to the belly. Uh, that said, uh, we were we were coming into the island of Grenada uh, on the 24th of uh, October 1980, and Grenada was an island just north of Venezuela, and the Russians and the Cubans were building airfields down there that would put Russian MiGs and Russian bombers within range of the United States. And a man of faith, 
uh, looked down there and said, this is not going to happen in, in my hemisphere or on my watch. And that was. No, let's, I want to point this out. That was happening under the Carter administration and the new Reagan administration. It was, that was the new Reagan administration that came in, right, and sent you over to Grenada. I, I never really understood why we went there. Yes, the Carter administration had been so feckless that uh, the, you know, the Russians felt like they could operate in the Western Hemisphere, particularly, you know, off our shores, literally. So Reagan comes in and uh, and he looks down there and sees what they're doing. And he says, not on my watch, not in my hemisphere. You're not going to do that. So he sent us and the 82nd and the Rangers and some Marines down to take the island away from the uh, Cubans and the Russians uh, to restore its government back to the offices they were elected to, and then to rescue over 600 American medical students that were being held hostage down there. And uh, we came, we came in by Blackhawk. Uh, the Delta Force did. We came in by Blackhawk, and it was the first time we'd ever used Blackhawks. And I was sitting in the troop door on the on the first Blackhawk. And we came across the waters of, Colum- of the uh, Caribbean there. And I uh, was sitting on the right side and I had my AR-15 under my arm and I had my weapon, I mean, my magazine stacked up there and we were ready to fight. And we came across the island there and got up on our target, which was a prison, a Richmond Hill prison. If you ever take a cruise down and go see Richmond Hill prison. Um, and, as we came up on Richmond Hill Prison, we started taking fire, and it was red tracers and green tracers, and they were all going through the through the rotor blades, and they were coming, hitting the bottom of the aircraft and all that, and then we were shooting back. Man, we were nailing them, and it was unbelievable because it, it, as soon as you knock one down, somebody else would get on the gun and keep hammering. You just could not stop these guns, and they, they were these 50 caliber anti-aircraft guns, and they were just hammering away, and then all of a sudden, wham, wham. I knew I'd been hit, and I'd been hit in the side of the chest. It took a big chunk out of my chest and then right up through my armpit. And uh, part of it came out the top of my shoulder, and part of it stayed in, in there and still in there today for the most part. Uh, and I, I thought they'd shot my arm off because I had no feeling, no use. Of, I stopped the bleeding. You know, that's all I could think of. Stopped the bleeding, and I did like this, and I realized, no, I got an arm, and I picked it up and laid it across my chest. And then we they, they kept shooting at us, and we – we kept shooting at them, and we made a second pass. We got shot out a second time. We had 54 holes in my aircraft, and I'm just telling you, that's a miracle that we had 54 holes in that aircraft, and we were still flying. And they didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to take me. They flew me out to uh, a carrier, a, a, a helicopter carrier, of all things, and uh, that, that the Marines had, had been on earlier that morning. And uh, they landed me on that deck, and they took me into surgery, uh, brought me out of surgery, took me back to Fort Bragg uh, and uh, operated on me a second time. And when they came out, they said, when I came out and woke up, they said, you know, sir, you got a very serious injury. They said, we need to take your left arm off. And I said, OK, so what's plan B? <laughs> and they said, no, you, you don't understand. You, you, you've got so much stuff in you that the chances of infection are very high. We need to take that off. And I couldn't use my arm. I couldn't feel my arm. I had no. And they said the, the the humerus bone in your left arm has been completely shot into. It, it, it does not connect it to your shoulder. And I said, I don't care. Do the best you can. Just do the best you can. God will heal me. I said, I've been, I've been praying and God told me if I'll trust him, he'll heal me. And of course, they said, oh, you have a good attitude. But what they didn't understand was, no, I mean, this was one of those times when I was seeking the Lord with all my heart. I was desperate because I didn't want to go through life, the rest of my life, you know, with this, this arm that was not functional or have, have them take it off. Right. And they would take it off right at the shoulder. I mean, that was that was where the injury was. So I just wasn't accepting that. And I just said, and I'd been praying and the Lord had told me, if you'll trust me, I'll heal you. So I just said, do, do the best you can. And this was 1983, you know, so they what they did is they put me in a cast. It started here, came up like this came around my body, you know, and, oh, and, uh, I mean, it was miserable. And they, they sent me home and they said, no, no, we're going to let you go home. This was after several days in the hospital. We're going to let you go home, but you have to stay upright. You can't, you can't lay down. And I had like a stick, 
you know, like it, it went from my wrist down to my waist here. So I couldn't do anything with this arm. And, uh, and I had to stay upright. I had to sleep upright and all kinds of stuff. So um, they sent me home, and I got to tell you, when the opioids wore off, let me tell you something. I was in the most miserable, unbelievable pain that you can imagine. And I was saying, why me, God? Why me, God? Why me, Lord? Why me? And and that's a kind of a standard thing, you know. We And I was saying, Lord, I'm a Christian. I, I'm not supposed to suffer. Why me? And that's not scriptural. That is not scriptural. And I finally, asked, I actually said, I said, Lord, you know, in case you forgot, I'm the one that led the prayer before we launched this operation. And if you don't heal me, it's going to look pretty bad for you, you know. <laughs> well, well, God did heal me. You know, he did heal this arm. And, you know, I still swing a golf club and I can still shoot a gun and a bow. And I still do the things I want to do, including hugging my grandchildren and my wife with an arm that they said you need to take off. So uh, God is still a miracle worker. And all you'd have to do is ask those doctors that told me that I need to take they needed to take that arm off. Uh, all you have to do is ask them. They they saw this miracle as it progressed and as I came through this. So we still serve a God that works miracles, and we need to remember that, and there's nothing too hard for him. Hey, uh, Jared, I, I don't ask a lot of guys to do this, but would you just uh, pray us out uh, for all the men who have been listening to this? And there's a lot of men wondering if they could ever be like you. Could they do that? Could they stand up under that? And just pray for courage. Because uh, the time for warriors is now, and it's not necessarily guys that can absorb a 50 cal machine gun bullet, but we need people who can speak truth and love and grace, yeah. but with absolute courage and clarity. Well, Father, we uh, we just uh, we come before you today thanking you for the men, Lord, that uh, have joined us, that will be watching this. God, we, we just thank you for them. We thank you for their heart, Lord. God, they are curious about you, God. They are hungry for you. And now we ask you, Lord, that you would uh, you would help them every day to put on the whole armor of God, Lord, and, uh, and to step into battle and go nose to nose and toe to toe, Lord. I ask you, God, to give them a, a transcendent cause, God. Give them a transcendent cause and let that cause, God, include serving you. Let them be so passionate about serving you that they're willing to take risks, that they're willing to to suffer. They're willing to sacrifice and they're willing to die, God, if that's what it takes. Because you are the king. And we all know, Lord, that you have control of our lives. But let us be so determined to please you, God, that the things that we do will be rejoiced in heaven, God. And now, Lord, we just ask that you would strengthen each of us, make us more wise, Lord, uh, in your ways and god would you walk with us take our hand and god lead us and give us the strength and the wisdom to follow you god for you are our king you're our commander you're our leader in jesus name we pray amen thanks for listening to on the edge podcast with ken harrison for a lot of you, this is our first time meeting, and I want to tell the men listening about an organization I'm the current chairman of, Promise Keepers. Promise Keepers is an organization founded by Coach Bill McCartney that's led men across the world to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Promise Keepers is calling men back to courageous and bold servant leadership. To learn more and get involved in the mission of Promise Keepers, visit promisekeepers.org. Follow on social media or download the Promise Keepers app on Apple Store or Google Play by searching Promise Keepers. Through the Promise Keepers app, you'll receive access to devotionals, Bible studies, and other great articles and video content, and a community to build friendships, lead your family, and become transformative leaders. See you next time for On the Edge with Ken Harrison.